Gift India Network is a consortium of four founding members, and there are other members. There are school charter members and other people also with us, like the Kaveri Gifted Education Research Center. Uh, Dr. Devsena is from there. But primarily, four founding members uh, Northwestern University Center for Talent Development is the most uh, senior member in terms of experience and expertise in gifted education. They've been around for four decades. Uh, done a lot of uh, good work. They are a part of uh, Northwestern University's School of Education and Social Policy. Uh, there is Agastya International Foundation, which has been doing various uh, gifted programs in India, including the Prime Minister's uh, program. And we work closely with them. And I'll, I'll tell you about myself a little later down the line. Uh, the third member is uh, EI Asset Talent Search. So Asset Talent Search is the premier uh, talent identification test in the country, which uh, several thousand children uh, take every year. Uh, so they identify gifted students uh, from grades five to nine. And the fourth member is Genwise, and I'm one of the co-founders of Genwise. And Genwise uh, essentially uh, provides uh, enrichment experiences for uh, children most of them gifted students, but also to other students. And we also work with teachers and schools to enable uh, them to work with gifted students and uh, just overall improve the quality of teaching learning in schools. So we've been conducting several camps and courses uh, since 2015, 16. So this uh, is a short introduction to Gifted India Network and uh, today's talk. So let me introduce our expert panelists. Uh, they have a, a lot of uh, experience uh, in this uh, field and they come from slightly differing uh, perspectives and uh, domains. So first, Dr. Uh, Bhushan Shukla, he's a child and adolescent psychiatrist. He's trained in India as well as in the UK. In his private practice for more than 20 years now, he has helped children with exceptional talent in different domains. It could be sports, theater, academics, non-traditional interests. So he's worked with uh, these children. And some of these children are now uh, adults, uh, happily many of them functioning quite well. So he has seen that uh, trajectory. And one of his aims when he works with families is to uh, help families to be a supportive and facilitatory asset for a child who wants to uh, really reach for the stars, you know, to uh, get into the domain of expertise, not just, you know, competency, but uh, expertise and uh, eminence, actually, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so that's Bhushan's introduction. Uh, Dr. Devasena Desai, uh, she has a PhD in parent training from uh, Jnana Prabodhini in Pune. Jnana Prabodhini is a very unique organization. They've been around for several decades, uh, gifted education with a very strong social purpose based on Indian values. For those of you who don't know about Jnana Prabodhini, so she will bring in a very different perspective into this. It's uh, because a lot of the gifted education thing comes from the Western perspective, but Jnana Prabodhini and people like Dr. Dev Sena bring an Indian perspective, even Bhushan uh, has looked a lot into uh, the Indian perspective, so uh, he will also bring in that. Uh, so Dr. Devsena has been 26 years in the field of parenting and teacher training. Uh, she was awarded the Bell and Blank Fellowship uh, about a decade ago. Uh, Bell and Blank uh, has done uh, uh, really great work in the field of gifted education over the years. Uh, I think it's a part of the University of Iowa. And uh, uh, Dr. Davison is an adjunct lecturer at the University of Iowa for the last few years. She also works, uh, she's a very key person in the Kaveri Gifted Education Research Center, which is a center in Pune, uh, which is, uh, there are four uh, schools, uh, which are, uh, you know, uh, the, the center works with four schools apart from, they also work for schools outside of these four schools, 
but these are the home schools, which is like sort of the testing lab. They work with uh, gifted children. They've tried many ideas, many ideas who are working very well. And some things, you know, they are refining based on their experiments there. So, so they're doing a lot of actual work with teachers and schools and learning from that in very much an Indian environment. She does a lot of parenting workshops. She's trained more than 350 teachers to sensitize them towards gifted students. Um, she counsels gifted adolescents and young adults. She trains counselors in gifted counseling. She's also associated with the European Council for Higher Ability, ECHA. And she's currently working on a white paper on gifted policies for the entire country. So she's at the forefront of a lot of work in India. So coming to uh, Dr. Roda Rosen, uh, uh, so Rhoda oversees CTD's enrichment programs for young students, whether it is summer, weekend, online courses, all kinds of courses. Additionally, she leads the parent education initiatives at CTD, and she's actively involved in professional learning and school outreach. Uh, she's worked as a university professor and a leader in the museum world. She continues to teach at the college level. Uh, so Rhoda is originally from South Africa. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, uh, she understands the Indian context uh, being in South Africa and uh, to quite some extent, I think. So uh, she's received a BA and MA from the University of uh, Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. And sorry if I pronounced that wrongly. And she has a PhD from the University of Illinois at uh, Chicago. She has a background in the arts and she draws on that background to help ensure that arts integration and the fostering of critical thinking are a central component of the unique uh, interdisciplinary offerings of CTD's uh, enrichment programs. And she contributes research to the field of creativity. So that's uh, about our panelists. Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, just a word about the audience before we jump into this panel, and I will also tell you what to expect. Uh, so the audience has a mix of parents, teachers, school leaders. Um, there are several questions they have posed to us at the time of registration. I've emailed those to you. So there are there were seventy questions which I have clubbed into categories. Uh, so though our Q and A session will start after about forty minutes into the session. Actually, right from the beginning, we are looking at your questions. So I have your questions in front of me, at least the broad themes. And as I pose questions to the panelists, I will actually take out snippets from your uh, questions. So many of your questions will get answered from minute one as they speak. But then, you know, you will have other questions. You will directly want to interact with the panelists. So we'll get into that about 40 minutes uh, into the session. Uh, many of you are uh, teachers and have asked what you can do in a classroom, what schools can do. So be a little patient because I think we need to cover some basic ground on what is giftedness, how is a you know, a, a gifted student different from just a smart student and uh, how does one nurture gifts and interest. So we need to cover a little bit of basic ground for 20, 25 minutes before we can get into what teachers and schools can do so that we have some common terminology and understanding of things. So please uh, be a little patient and don't uh, go away thinking that, you know, we're not talking about schools and teachers right away. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, get uh, started. So the uh, for the first few minutes, uh, I would like our panelists to talk a little bit about uh, defining and identifying giftedness. So I'll tell you the kind of questions which have been posed to us. Um, so uh, some of the parents are like, hey, I think my child is very bright, but then I necessarily am not able to assess this objectively. So how do I know that is my child just bright or is he you know, gifted? Does he need some special uh, support? Uh, so that's... Uh, one kind of uh, a question. The other kind of question out here is, uh, my child is uh, very good in art, painting, and so on, 
does that also qualify as giftedness or is it only in the academic uh, domain is giftedness uh, if i take my child for giftedness assessment is only iq measured so i'm going to pause here and uh, invite uh, maybe you know uh, dr bhushan to go first and uh, followed by dr deep sena yeah yeah uh, bhushan you are on mute yep that that was that button just became sticky sorry sure sure uh, so uh, you have sent me in with the f facing the first ball all right <laughs> i'll just try and keep my wicket there uh, I, i think uh, be before we even go into giftedness we will have to talk about how do we draw the lines for giftedness okay uh, is it is it going to be a modern child's birthday where everybody gets a gift and everybody is called gifted or are we really going to talk about the ancient times when uh, only one person in the whole ceremony is ever going to get any gift at all so where do we draw the line is really important and probably we should discuss that and i would love to hear from other panelists about that sure makes sense to to every parent their child is a gift particularly now in india where we have stopped having half a dozen children or one dozen children and are restricting ourselves to one and two every child is a gift uh, is the child gifted in any specific sense is a really a tricky one uh, so uh, should we be talking only about iq should we be talking about exceptional abilities then where do we draw the line for exception in a country of 140 crore 1.4 billion people even when you say a child is one in a million there are going to be 1400 of us like that so exactly where do you draw the line is it is it a objective line or is it a statistical line or where are we going to draw the line i think that is something that we need to discuss before we even talk about giftedness so where would you i mean are there lines you would draw or we can listen to what they say and you would have to say before that yeah. yeah i would i would love to hear from them yeah 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 Please. um hello everyone and uh yes it's a very important topic and i'm glad that uh, bhushan has started off with first defining because this is something that i always face when we have parents come in and everybody feels that their child is really very bright and uh, see a lot of talent um if we have to just look at when a child is born and like he rightly said we have only most parents have single child and the entire attention is on the child uh you would see that not just the parents the grandparents and everybody related spending a lot of time and investing a lot of learning processes with the child and you will see a lot of spark and that makes it uh exciting for the parents when they come to the school and say i think i have a very uh intelligent child i've seen him or her perform uh rattle a lot of uh, words they'll come with 100 words a uh, double uh, you know uh, associated sentences very specific uh, information which makes us uh, want to believe that the child is uh, showing exceptional talent now when we talk about giftedness at least what we would like to believe is that we're looking one and normally when we are saying in terms of obser observing them in a classroom of 40 in india we have about 40 to 50 kids you will see when you compare with the peers this child stands out uh maybe 6 months 1 year or 2 years above his peer group in any particular area be it academic if it is non academic and you're looking at talent they will be able to show uh above their uh, peers and this is not like a spark that you see once in a few months that the child is showing this kind of uh, behavior but consistently you will see that curiosity uh, the need to explore and to uh, have attention span higher than their age group so that's that's exactly how we would like to really see and uh, view children and talk about them because they are often confused with children who uh, are able to play a lot with memory and recital because there's a lot of growth learning taking place during that particular age so that's when i think it gets confusing thanks devsena roda would you like to say something about this yeah. yes i would um 
Thank you so much, everyone, for being here and for inviting us from America. And uh, yes, I think we share a lot in common uh, as someone who comes from uh, also a former British colony. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say that uh, I think the question for me is not so much what is and isn't gifted, but why parents want the best for their children, right? We all are trying to do the very best for our children. And so the question is why we uh, are invested in the label gifted. Um, so a person who's gifted for us, I think, as Devasina said, is someone who's performing way ahead of their peers in a specific domain. It can be art, it can be math. When they're very young, that domain specificity won't necessarily be there yet because the child hasn't been exposed to very many domains, right? So, so, so as they grow, so it's going to be generalized. And as they sort of develop interests, you'll notice the attention and um, the development of a passion in a certain area. And once they are perform outperforming peers of that age group, you know that this is a child with a gift in that area. Um, and as parents, you'd want, to know, you'd want to nurture that. But I think that if the term gifted is necessary, I have a cat trying to uh, get my attention. If, um, if the, so there's no real need to make a distinction between a child who's smart or a child who's bright or where's the exact line? Is it a number? Rather that giftedness, um, to know that it goes from generalized to domain specific, and also that the label can be important only insofar as you need it for a particular thing. So for example, if there's a gifted program at school and you want your child to have access to that, then the label becomes important and, um, and, and you'd want to know what the criteria are for entrance into that program. But other than that, it's a matter of performance against peers. So I think giving up the label is sort of a really, for us giftedness, there are two, sorry, I just want to say this and then I'll be done. There are two different sort of schools of thought about giftedness. And when you ask, is my child gifted? It assumes that giftedness is a category that we can understand a category that um, is stable, like my curly hair or someone else's blue eyes. And if you believe that, then you believe that it can't be changed, that nothing the child can do can help, or that you can do as a parent can help intervene and develop that. We don't really, and that it comes with a set of unique psychological characteristics. At the Center for Talent Development, the research, the research in general doesn't bear that out. The research doesn't bear out that there's a number at which a certain number of psychological traits or problems or challenges will em emerge. And it doesn't bear out that, um, that talent is uh, stable but rather that it's malleable and it can change over time. So we really believe in a talent development framework. And instead of asking about the label, we ask about how we can help the child that's showing and expressing an interest and a talent develop that talent. And so it's the arc of talent development that we're really interested in. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rhoda. I think that's uh, very useful. And I just want to paraphrase some of the things Rhoda said. So what I understand is that um, it is the context which decides uh, how you would determine, you know, whether somebody is gifted, the need for it. Otherwise, there is really no need for it. But often we will find that the context may determine that. And we too, the Gifted India Network subscribes to this talent development framework where we believe that 
there are trajectories uh, so we don't want to get too much into this nature nurture debate but my personal belief is that both uh, both are there and you know uh, anybody arguing too strongly on one side is missing the sort of uh, point um so roda uh, now that we have some idea about where all of you stand on this uh defining giftedness perhaps you can just speak a bit about identifying giftedness i'll tell you the kind of questions which people have on their mind one is um like especially the parents of younger children maybe the older children you know if they are academically gifted they take a sat p sat or they very good in the violin or art or something it's it's a little bit easier but when the child is 4 5 6 years old and some of the uh, parents who are attending today they in fact uh, called me and you know so somebody has taken the uh, and i'm i'm not uh, into this right so you guys know the thing so some wisc 5 and wppi something else and there is a 16 page report and now they don't know what to do with this right uh, so um so what are the general approaches for identification uh, which one should adopt are these different at different ages and uh, maybe you know in the next in the next few minutes of this conversation finally i would like some recommendations on specific tests if at all because a lot of the parents are saying where do i go for an objective assessment So, if at all you recommend something like that, yeah. Did you want to start with me? Yeah, yeah. Please okay. start. Yeah. Thank you so much, parents. This is a very similar question to what is gifted, um, which is I think Vishnu said the most important thing, which is now I have a sixteen-page report and I don't know what it means. <laughs> Still there? Are we gifted? But again. Um, we sort of believe that the test is important only the assessment is important only in so far as what it's going to be useful for you know no single test um no single data point in time is sufficient to understand a child's abilities you know professional you are absolutely right ability matters absolutely um it's not all that matters and it's not the most important point of what matters so if i'm a really advanced learner and i look out the window and i sort of an um un, un, am unfocused during a test that can be three points on the test you know we're kids they're kids so you don't want to think of a single data point as determining a child's life rather the way we want to think about it is what do we want out of this we want our children to grow and have the challenging education they need they need to study and learn at the level they're competent to do so so for some children that ceiling will be really high and for some it's not right our job as educators is to get them to the level of challenge that's appropriate for them and not have them um uh disaffected as learners because they're sitting in an unchallenging environment that's the aim so if as far as assessments can help us reach that think of assessment this is how i think of assessment as a process of continually finding out where you are um demonstrating allowing the child to demonstrate what they know so that you can get them to those challenging opportunities no single test is going to do that but rather that every challenging experience should have a pre test and a post test and an iq test can be valuable if that's for the criteria for getting into a classroom but but and and of course just because a a student tests well on one day and well on another day doesn't mean that they've slipped back and they're not gifted anymore right it's rather that they could have lost focus they could not be interested in this field all sorts of things shift those drop data points so rather think of it as a cycle of how we find out where the child is and where we need to move them to so that's the way we think about it now in terms of what devasina was saying in terms of you know in a classroom of 40 people you know what is the who are the students performing at the top 10% it's the same that is a very useful grades can be very useful because it's local to that population it doesn't matter if 
I perform um, less than Vishnu, right? It, it Globally, it matters in my local situation because that's where I'm going to get the next step in my curriculum. So all of these things are both contextual and about getting the child the right challenge. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Bhushan, uh, if you can share something about identifying and assessment. So I, I am not an educator. So the only children that reach me uh, who are gifted are from two sources. One is I, I work with certain specific uh, sports academies. So uh, that is how they reach me. And second part is when children are identified as gifted, but they land into some or the other mental health issue, uh, they reach me. Uh, the sports part typically reaches me when the coach sees that a child is developing certain difficulties. So performing below par because of psychological impairments, they, they reach me. So that is, that is my point of view, or that is the vantage point of giftedness that I have. I, now I get a lot many parents bringing their children to me for what they call as mental coaching of giftedness. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly where that word has come from. Probably as, mm -hmm. as a country, as we start earning more money and start to focus on sports instead of purely medicine and engineering, uh, people also are aware that mental health and mental preparedness or mental toughness has equal value in sports. So they come to me believing that psychiatrists will be able to give them some special training. My standard procedure uh, that I have maintained for last 20 years is I do not take direct referrals from parents. I, I specifically ask them that, let me talk to the coach or the teachers. And the question that I ask the coaches or the teachers is that uh, in your experience, and most of them have worked for 10 years, 15 years, or even more than that, where would you put this child? In what percentile would you put the child? And my experience is that teachers, coaches, and all of these people have an insider view of talent. They may not be able to articulate that as what we educationists and psychologists are doing here, but they know talent when they see one. Because if they have worked with the child for six months, eight months, or a year, they, they identify the patterns, they identify where the child sits. And I would like to take it from the coach of that child that yes, this child is a good one. He is a cut above others. That is something that encourages me to work with that child or not discourage the parents from saying that my child is gifted. So that is one thing that I have used again and again. Second few objective criteria that I use uh, are that say, for example, a child is playing chess at the age of three years and four years. And you know that uh, in the city where I live and work, Pune, children typically start learning chess at two and a half and three years, right? So how, what does the coach think of that? That is important. And how fast is the child progressing? In a very populous country like ours, performing at the top of your age range is not enough to be gifted. You have to be punching above your weight, and that is a sign of giftedness, at least in sports. For example, uh, recently I talked to a chap who's 14 years old and very keen on tennis and uh, spending good six hours every day on tennis. Now, here is a question of resource allocation, because the parents are going to ask me how much money should we spend on this? Should we let him bunk school to play tennis? What should be our direction? Here, clear, concrete decisions are to be taken and money is at stake. If you are struggling to get in top 100 in India, in your age group, then there is a very little chance that you are gifted. Because if you see all the professional tennis players, and which would be the aim of any sportsman to go professional if they are talented, they had already qualified for two and three brackets above their age group at a very early age. These are important things to remember. If we are talking about art, and uh, performing arts and things like that. I think in India, we have a very long tradition going back two and a half, three thousand 3,000 years where you have a guru who, who mentors you. And gurus are excellent in identifying the talent very early on. 
you know, as early as four and five year old, a Kathak teacher or a Bharatnatyam teacher will be able to tell you that this boy or this girl is exceptional. I haven't seen anything like this in last five years, 10 years or 20 years. That, that is a very good sign. Many times parents do not believe teachers and they believe that I must change the teacher to get a better teacher for my child. I am not very keen on that. If you're talking about maths, physics, and science kind of stuff, then another difficulty is that how does the child behave is something that is important for me. What is their seeking pattern? Truly gifted children will be self-learners, particularly in this area. They would not only be gathering information. For me, the key point is, are they able to connect dots? Every five-year-old who has access to YouTube now talks about black holes and wormholes and spaghettification that happens on the edge of the black hole. But you ask the second and the third level deeper question and you realize the knowledge hasn't gone beyond YouTube. Now that is not giftedness. Unfortunately, that breaks heart of many parents. But is the child able to pursue knowledge? Is the child hungry for that knowledge? Are they driven by that curiosity? Are they able to connect dots? This is something that is really important because now all the children that we are talking about, all the parents who have joined here have unlimited internet access. And for a true learner, that's a phenomenal gift. How do they, how are they using that gift tells me a lot about their giftedness. That is, that is how I would go about it. Thanks. This is uh, very useful. Um... So, uh, Devsena, if you can uh, continue this, and I'm especially curious, uh, Bhushan has spoken a lot about um, observations, the knowledge of gurus and uh, teachers who are observing the child. Um, so I'm curious about uh, also, what do you think about the formal methods? Apart from this, when do formal tests, whether it's IQ tests or whatever other, we don't even know what the other kinds of tests are. So if you could, you know, enlighten us a bit, about your view on identifying giftedness and the use of formal assessments too. One minute if I can button, Vishnu. Yes, yes. Please, uh, there's sorry. one, sorry, uh, Dr. Uh, Devsa, just there's a question that straight uh, takes off from what Dr. Bhushan said. Just can classifying a child as gifted falsely uh, be detrimental to the child's development? So I'm going to continue with uh, the conversations that has taken place with both what Rhoda has been talking about talent development and what Dr. Shukla has been talking about how to observe and uh, trust the people who are associated uh, like the chess uh, master or the guru who teaches uh, singing or other performing arts, the gut feeling they have. They've been seeing so many children and they can make out when a child has innate ability and potential and shows that when they are with other children, they are able to see the way they are grasping and moving ahead. Uh, unfortunately, in our system, India as such, performance is given more precedence than nurturing talent. And at Kaveri Gifted Education Center, we, though are using our schools as labs, uh, we would like to focus on talent. Uh, the word is interchangeably used, uh, gifted, high ability, intelligent, high intelligent. You can add as many adjectives, but that does not really, uh, you know, um, say specifically and classify the child as being a gifted. So this heavy loadedness has to be first and foremost removed. And if we talk more about testing, I know even in this platform, parents will be very eager to say, where is the next uh, um, assessment person who can do the assessment? And we've had parents who have said, if my child is 110, what should I do to make it 120 and 130? Uh, this is a lot of pressure and unnecessary focus, especially for young children. And we're talking about very young kids. So as a psychologist, I would say that uh, not to test children as early as possible. And like Rhoda mentioned, only if there is a possibility and availability of programs or uh, uh, areas that very specifically is required, that is the only reason when we do it. And again, we don't really uh, fall completely on standardized tests. 
So if you say 130, 140 IQ or 99, 99.9 .9 percentile, uh, we are also looking at the context and the kind of development the child is showing in that particular area, being it science, math, social sciences, languages, you would uh, find very easily that uh, children are curious and they are constantly flipping the way they see and read things. So these are signs and we have to see consistency. For example, there, is, there was a child who was about three and a half, uh, two and a half, three years old who was at a crash and where, uh, you know, in that particular room, there was a light which had these very small bubble-like kind of, um, you know, vision. And the child saw that light and, you know, was very fascinated. And then later, a couple of days later, uh, somebody was playing with bubbles and you could see these small round bubbles going around. And she was able to connect both and talk about it. And the mother was not able to, you know, understand and that's when you see, this is an incident. It looks like a stray incident, but we are saying that this child consistently is looking and connecting and synthesizing, like uh, Bhushan was talking, connecting the dots and not looking at regular stuff and repeating or rote memorizing stuff. When they do this, this kind of synthesis is when we are talking about seeing that they are exceptional. And in a classroom of 40, Yes, uh, each class will have its own uh, particular uh, talented and uh, high ability kids. We, to make it more convenient for a class, we would talk about the top 10% so that we can focus on challenges that can be worked out for those children and they don't get bored, uh, you know, restless, distracted. That's when if they're neglected, then you see certain misbehaviors happening and then they need uh, support from other systems, basically. Uh, so, Devsan, I have uh, two quick questions. One is what Soumya asked. And so, basically, is there a downside to not identifying giftedness is one part of the question. And the opposite of that. So, if we wrongly identify someone as gifted, is there a downside to that? So, what is what are the implications of... Uh, so if if we have uh, let me look at the uh, downside if you're talking about uh, yeah. that does happen uh, some many a times uh, many parents are uh, not very keen uh, they accept the child for who he or she is and focus on giving the resources and enjoy the learning process along with the child and today being from certain privileged backgrounds we are able to have access to excellent resource uh, people, centers who can nurture children. And I think that's a wonderful uh, space, basically. And um, if they're not recognized, sometimes you would find as young adults, uh, there is a sense of having lost, of not having uh, completely explored their potential. That happens. I've seen young adults say, when they come with their child and you're asking, this kind of behavior that is describing about your child, uh, does the parent, any one of the parent or grandparents have, and they would say that I was like this as a child. And uh, we didn't know about giftedness or high ability then, I just grew up. But today, looking back, I wish I had the kind of opportunities that I am giving to my child. And I'm sure I could have done much more. So in hindsight, maybe you would feel a little bad uh, but I don't see that uh, they really suffer. But some of them might be masking their talent and ability because they feel that they are a misfit and they want to fit along with the rest of the children in their classroom and might not want to show exhibit too much of their uh, talent or showcase their abilities. Then, then there is a struggle, you know, emotionally for them, they struggle to get along with others. So these are certain specific areas that really happens. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Rura, yeah. So I just wanted to say absolutely. Um. Uh. I. I. I agree with Devasina. So. Um. I would again say it this way: that the idea in talent development is to challenge the child, at the level that they can be challenged. 
you don't want it to be too much challenged, the child will say, I'm bored and withdraw their interest because they're frustrated and they can't do something. Equally, if it's not challenging, the child just, to Devasina's point, just sits in class and pretends to be like the others or just disassociates from education, from the educational process. So the idea is to get the child challenged. If we don't identify early on in the terms of see, just the behaviors, seeing your child um, as performing as they perform against peers, your child, the process can can be exactly as Devasina says in, in terms of um, in terms of they start to have to compensate psychologically for where they are contextually, or they start to not they disengage from education from the content. And so finding those, I love the way she put it, um, finding those resources, visits on family days to museums or cultural centers, supplemental education when they're very little, where they can do, you know, at CTD, they can do uh, two and a half hours on a Saturday morning on dinosaurs, because that's what they're interested in, right? Just nurturing those talents may seem to a parent like, well, that's not educate, you know, it's not in a playful situation, may seem to a parent like you're not doing enough, but in actual fact, the psychological skills that they're learning in terms of being self-starters, autonomous learners, collaborative with peers, learning in a situation where other students are like them, that's really important. Other students are also interested in dinosaurs and want to spend their whole morning doing that, right? Those things translate and create a love of learning that translates to the classroom area so that they can connect those dots. And so it's really important the exposure that to different topics so that they can find that area of interest is really important and so that they can be challenged with other people who are like them, who have the same level of interest and are gonna give it their all is really important. And that's why uh, I think Devastina spoke about the top 10%, not as a criteria so much as then we can push people at the 75th to want to get to 80, and the people at 80 to want to get to 85, right? We can sort of we can sort of encourage that arc and that movement because we believe also that just because you didn't get 90 at one moment in time doesn't mean you won't sort of develop your passion, find your talent, and and enter the net, you know, like catch people, make a broad net to catch people as you go along. It's not just a moment in time. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rhoda. And as you've started uh, talking a little bit about what kind of um, enrichment and what kind of programs can be done for young children, uh, maybe you can expand a little bit on how these, uh, I know that CT does a lot of uh, programs for uh, talent uh, development, right, I think from age uh, three onwards for families. So if you can talk a bit about what happens in these programs and um, maybe uh, spend a bit of time uh, on this uh, because there are a couple of related questions. One is uh, uh, play is very important in childhood and earlier in childhood, you know, uh, more, more play is required. So where does play fit into this? I mean, we read about, you know, uh, young kids going and spending hours in chess or uh, something else. And uh, um, I mean, sometimes you're doubtful, does the child really want to do it? Is the parent uh, uh, pushing, you know? So so what is uh, going on out here? So maybe if you can come to the role of play also along the line in this. Yeah. Thank you so much. So um, I like to think of it as what um, in some areas in America is called guided play. So a child can play, right? And hopefully children are playing. That's fantastic. They're developing all sorts of things through play. We know that from research, they're developing how to, uh, how to as they're playing with role modeling, they're learning about socialization. They're learning how to play by themselves. They're developing attention to and focus. 
um, when they're collaborating with others, they're learning interpersonal skills. So play is super important. Then there's work <laughs> and play is, child's, is a child's work in a sense. So parents, so in our classrooms, we don't assess for young children at the end of it, how the, what the product looks like, right? What the end product looks like. It's very process oriented. We're looking and we're providing the playful experiences that will hold a child's attention in order for them to learn autonomy and collaboration, to learn to be self-starters, which was something that um, Dr. Shukla also um, identified as important and it's learned, right? A child can learn once they're interested to, to, to be motivated in a particular topic. We're looking for those things. But primarily we're looking for the way a child, what Dr. Shukla and um, Devasina Desai has been talking about as, um, as, as connecting the dots. We're looking for the critical, the questions the child is asking. So I wanna tell you a story. It was just, it was with children who were a little bit older. They were in fifth grade and they were learning in um, our university setting um, about the engineering research and design method. And out of this, they had to build in groups, they had to build a heart valve for a heart. <laughs> out of cardboard and plastic and all sorts of things, straws, all sorts of things that children would get a hold of in the home, right? Perhaps in some homes. And so um, the teacher came outside and one of the, in the hallways, the children were stretched out in the hallways and one group, their heart valve just wasn't working. Quite clearly, it wasn't gonna work. So the teacher asked, didn't tell them what they were doing wrong. Asked the question what they might try. This is really important that as parents, we very quickly might jump because of our own educational background, as we've been talking about, we didn't have these, these opportunities, might jump to, you should do that, or you should try that, but rather asking the child to find the questions is really important. It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. The fact that they start to think about higher order critical questioning is important in our classrooms. So the child said, well, obviously it doesn't work. You gave us red water. You gave us colored water dye, you know, food dye with, in water as the blood. If it was viscous, it would work. So the teacher was delighted by this. It's, if it was viscous, it was work. But he didn't give it to them. He said, okay, take your teaching assistant, walk down to the other building, get the cornstarch, come back, make something that's viscous like blood, See how it goes. The child did all that, right? That's experiential learning. They have to walk to another building, get the cornstarch, come back. They did it. Of course, the teacher knew it wasn't going to work. They tried it out. It didn't work. And the teacher said, ah, so what in the research and design method haven't you tried yet? And they went back to square one. By the time they got picked up that day, they didn't have a heart valve yet that worked. That's not the important piece. They had a big mess all over the corridor, which we love to see because the mess is a sign of all the experimentation that was going on. But they had asked a series of questions that moved them forward to being able to solve that problem. That's a very difficult thing for a parent to see in guided play because they're worried that their child didn't get to the answer. So what we suggest for parents is to remember that you're not there as the teacher. They're gonna have so many teachers in their lives. You're there, think of it as sort of coaching. You're there to provide in play, back to blocks and building blocks. You're there to provide vocabulary. Oh, we're playing with blocks together. I love that lintel that you just made, <laughs> whatever. I love the Doric column you just made, whatever. But um, we're there to provide that sort of scaffolding and we're there to provide questions. How might, what might you think of um, that would make that roof sturdier? Is there, you know, is there a way to make the roof sturdy? I see you're really struggling with that. We're trying to get parents to not worry about the product but to think about the higher order questions that will lead a child to connect those dots. And so that's what our classroom looks like. They're 
they're playful, they're hands-on, they're experimental. We don't worry too much about, of course, competency and content is important, but gifted children know their way to the internet and to Dr. Google. So that's not what we're concentrating on. We're concentrating on the experimental, the hands-on, the fun, the higher order critical thinking skills, and the higher order questions. And that's what you'll see in our classroom. Thanks, Rhoda. Uh, what you said is very interesting. In fact, what I am taking away from this is that we have certain standard definitions of play and work, but uh, how do you define what is play and what is work? Perhaps for a child uh, that was play, uh, right? Uh, working on that heart wall and uh, uh, so on. And maybe for a child who's in a very challenging math classroom, that math is play. So it's perhaps the context in which the learning process is placed, where now you've removed the fear of the outcome. So it is, uh, yeah, so that, that, that's very interesting. Uh, Rhoda, I'd like to, to just step in here, yeah, Ra, Vishnu. Uh, yeah. I'd like to take the conversation forward when we're talking about play. And I'm looking yeah. at the Indian context. Yeah. Uh, if a child wants to read and is reading continuously, I've heard parents who say, it's past midnight and you have the six-year-old with the torch uh, putting the blanket and reading. And they're worried whether uh, he will be sleepy when he goes uh, to mm -hmm. school and uh, uh, what the teacher will say and stuff like that. And if I talk to the child, the child says that, and they'll say that this is the same book he's been reading for past two weeks. And what is there in it? I mean, he already knows he has read it several times. When you talk to the child, the child is seeing an ending every day. He changes the characters. He's playing mismatch and trying to see a different ending. And he's fascinated by the ending. And for him, that peaceful time when nobody uh, is going to trouble him and give him instructions of do this, do that, is a wonderful time. And uh, we are more focused upon, uh, you know, being in time to school, uh, ensuring that you finish your homework and stuff. That's that's what we're talking about performance rather than the process. The second point is uh, we might get bored by their repetitive activity. They never get bored. And if they are not bored and they're enjoying, that's both learning and play for me. So Parents are the best people to judge and put a pause button and wait and observe uh, what kind of learning the child is doing. And like Rhoda was saying, in terms of the kind of questions they are asking, and you will find, I mean, the question that you'd asked me in the beginning is bright child and a gifted child. So if you have to say, uh, the gifted child will be asking questions and will be curious and will ask questions which are very thought provoking, which is connecting to deeper meaning and understanding. Well, you have a bright child who will just want an answer and is very happy, you know? So that itself really clearly says, and these are the kids who will not stop with just one answer. They need more meaning, they need more reading, they need more discussion, and they will argue so much and they're not scared of authority they're not scared of asking uh, a question until they find an answer. So these are very unique characteristics. And if we kind of want to tame them, that's what I would like to see. Like cut them short and say, uh, no, let's get back to completing this. Let's get back to focusing what a school is required. Uh, we are really limiting their learning experiences. And we need to, as parents and as educators, look at nurturing. And especially when you're looking at primary school, what are we talking about in terms of whether it's A plus or A? For them, the joy of learning is more important than those grades. And sometimes you'll find it's not the A plus kid who's gifted. You might find a kid who's C or D who is not bothered, who knows the answers and will say, I don't want to write it because I find it very boring, you know? Thanks, Devasena. Uh, I'm realizing that we're already about two thirds into the session in terms of time and at 7.30 we need to close. Uh, so what I will do is I'll quickly take five, six minutes uh, to ask a couple of questions because a lot of parents have asked these questions and after that we'll open it up and uh, to parents and teachers. 
So one question, uh, uh, so I'm going to uh, pose three questions, which are like sort of repeating a lot in the area of nurturing gifts and interests, and maybe Devsina can take it first and then Rhoda. So one question is, um, my child is, uh, 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 her interest is very different and advanced for this age. It could be like the reading thing you mentioned or math or whatever uh, it is. So how do I help the child adjust when the interests are so much above the age? That is sort of one uh, question which many people have asked. Another question is because the last two years are in this pandemic uh, online situation, so that seems to exacerbate the problem. So what do we do uh, you know, in the online situation? And the third question is actually just looking for specific resources. Are there you know, programs, are there uh, resources I can go to and maybe we can come to, come to that at the end. So do you see some uh, ideas on this? Uh, what popularly parents do is they take, uh, supposing it's math or science or languages, they take books that are of higher, like supposing I'm in third grade, they may take uh, ICSC syllabus board or they would take levels which are higher to that child in terms of reading literature books and give it to the child and go along with them. Uh, complement it with uh, books that they can take from the library, which, you know, ask permission at school where normally in schools we have very restrictive pattern that you are of this class, you can't go to the next cupboard, which is for the next grade. You know, that's very limiting. I have already finished reading this and I've just begun in the school, you know, and so to allow them to have the flexibility and monitor that kind of reading. That is one. Uh, second is Maybe that. Sorry to interrupt. But because you've been doing some of these things uh, with the schools Kaveri is associated with, maybe you can elaborate on things like the privilege cards and so on. So, uh, you know, people get some yeah. ideas as well. Yeah, yeah thanks yeah. for uh, bringing that. Um, yeah. See, it's very difficult for us in India, mainly because the number of children, the logistics, and the school at times being very rigid about rules and regulations and not wanting to allow because they feel that the child will start uh, misusing the privileges that he or she has. Supposing I love him for next cupboard, then he's going to ask so many things and as the librarian, I have to monitor, you know, these kind of things that happen. So what we have come up with, what we call is the privilege cards. And uh, this is basically from the travels that we have done both in the Western countries and seen that kids own their learning. In India, it's still, it's handed over, you know, parents, give them a structure, a school gives a structure. Here, we want the child to continue to own his or her learning experience. So they're given about six privilege cards with the name laminated. And uh, every month in the beginning, they get these cards and they can give it to their teacher, any class, even if it is something supposed to be sacramental, like in terms of math, you can just give it to the teacher and say, I would want to go either to the utter tinkering lab, go to the library, or come to a free space that we have called, which is called uh, in you know a kata or a hangout place where you have a few cushions put and advanced reading materials are kept, and they sit there and they do what they would want to do for that one uh, period, where they don't have a structure and they have the privilege of wanting to do what they want to do, and sometimes kids have a plan, they are doing a project which is continuous and they want that time. Sometimes they don't have a plan. They just want to hang out. So we have psychologists and uh, mentors sitting along with them whom, with whom they have discussions. Sometimes it's personal nature. Sometimes it's struggles in school, making friends, uh, talking about how they would want to be with another person while they're doing a project, whose idea is best and how do they go about negotiating their ideas. Uh, after the end of the six cards that they use during the six, uh, one month period, the cards are again given back to them the next month so that they can make use of them. So basically we would want the child to own his or her uh, space in school where he has the freedom to make choices of uh, either going to the library or going to the math lab or doing any project of advanced nature. Second is that uh, 
what we are working now again is also sharing with teachers where they can talk about having at least two or three questions which are of challenging nature which can be given when they are doing assessments not give the uh, regular things that the children get bored so if you have a a and b in which they can choose we give them a c and b and if they've chosen c and b they could get a little more um, what do you say specific comments from teachers of the kind of challenges that they have worked out what kind of problems and how did they choose those steps etc uh, the third is during the teacher training program uh, which in our schools have been made mandatory and that's the reason how we have covered most of the teachers uh, by sensitizing and making them aware of the needs of the children in the classroom is uh, seeing that they can incorporate some level of higher order thinking all schools and most teachers will say that we are doing inquiry based learning we are doing higher order thinking but when you really get into the class and when you have a 35 minute period and you have so many children and a syllabus to complete it becomes more of a um, these are things done on a maybe couple of times only and not as regularly as possible which would help a child with high ability to really find it interesting in a classroom so then these children are made um, you know they are told that they are the teachers who have this advanced learning and math or science and they can go with them once or twice a week to have a discussion and take uh, their interest forward and it need have to be really only math or only science or only social sciences it can be this uh, interdisciplinary by nature so they could choose areas that they could be connected and they can talk about it coming back the age group that we are talking about again i would say just going into a lot of exploration not getting into any kind of structure at all um like rada was saying guided learning yes but they need to have the freedom to explore and be as creative as possible and not limit in in the way they are going and most often uh children do have a lot of learning experiences and you would find that gifted kids have this one um area or a topic that they are stuck with and they would want to talk about it for me next 6 months and maybe the school may not be um tuned to they would have in their syllabus maybe only for the next two weeks so we'll have to see how to use the topic and you know uh, see that the child is able to sustain in using it in different perspective look at it when you're looking in math the same thing if you're talking about fishes uh, swimming you know we are talking about how in which direction it's going if it is going in speed take it into science take it into math take it into languages take it into poetry so you can do that and that could make it interesting for the child so that's exactly what we are looking off in a school system basically thanks thanks uh, devsina so roda if you can uh, talk a bit about the gifted programming and especially online in this pandemic situation can something be done meaningfully yeah yeah thank you so much um vishnu i just i just if i could just step back for one second to say maybe it's helpful even though you have parent your parents of young children to see what the arc of talent talent development yes, is please. yes please. that would be helpful because yeah. we think the the youngest ages as being called an emergent stage of talent development and it requires different sort of uh developmental uh or it, it requires sort of different things from a parent than say, and and educators and supporters than uh the middle stage which we would sort of called competency and 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 then of course uh excellence developing into excellence right and as adults maybe even eminence so in the in the very early stage what we want primarily is exposure so an example of this is you in america at least you get lots of little kids saying they want to be firemen because they see fire trucks right they don't say oh i want to be a college counselor because they're likely not to know that that's even a field until later on right so when they find out that that's a field they would be at the emergent stage of talent it's not really age related right and it doesn't mean you have to start at this particular age in order to uh 
bring it to fruition at a particular other other age. And there are different developmental stages. So for example, for a gymnast, the trajectory is different than for a psychologist. You can start later as a psychologist and peak later as a psychologist. So all of these things are important in developing talent. But in the early stage of talent, imagining that it's in an early childhood area and years, you want the child to be exposed to a variety of topics, dinosaurs, whole wormholes, whatever, all these things, because you don't know. And anything you think you might know, you don't know. We're probably always wrong about where a child's interests are going to lie. So that stu it has to be led by the student. Um, and so that stu otherwise the student won't develop the, the interest and then the passion and et cetera in that. So in those early years, it's really important, the psychosocial skills that we're looking for are autonomous learning, being able to separate from your parent and go to the classroom, right? That's an important skill to learn. Um, collaborative learning, how to work with others, um, how to develop attention and focus. Those are the sorts of things that we're looking for in our classrooms. And there are times where you just wanna to say to a parent sort of, stand back so that the child can develop these and has the space to develop these. And we might do that through center-based learning. We'll have different centers in a room that a child can find their way to and sort of, um, and, 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 and find the way they can demonstrate what they know because children demonstrate that if you give them the opportunity to creatively in different ways. So some children may just demonstrate it on a test. Other children need to demonstrate it with their bodies, right? Um, or with art or with whatever way. And so we try to give them different ways to demonstrate what they know. When they get to the competency level, they're gonna need so social skills like thinking of themselves as a scholar, saying, I am a mathematician, right? I am a this, I am an engineer. I'm So at that time where they're learning the competency of the skill, the skills needed for that field, that's where it's important for growth mindsets. So one of the things that someone asked is, is there, is there something detrimental to the label gifted? And they can be, because if a child is invested in that label, they start to take fewer risks because they may start to take fewer risks because they don't want it to go away. So if the teacher says, do this, they do this. They don't do further than this. Right? They don't want to do anything experimental that could lose in that, that, that label. Therefore, these supplemental opportunities that are low risk, that don't have grades, are really important for students to be able to take the academic risks they need to develop creativity in any field. Right? And, and, and that's important for the development of themselves as a little mathematician or a budding engineer or artist or whatever. And finally, as they're in high school, they sort of, sort of have to learn the, how to compete at advanced levels, what the tacit authentic work looks like in a field. And so mentoring and you know, getting um, authentic, uh, experiences in a field with the language, how professionals think is really sort of very important for those students. So there are psychosocial skills, how to, how to approach a mentor, um, how to learn what, how to manage performance anxiety. All of these things will become important over time. There are different psychosocial skills. And so we concentrate just as much on those psychosocial skill development, instead of saying what we'll hear often is, um, Gifted children are perfectionists. Well, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> that's not necessarily true. Could be, couldn't be. What we say is, yeah, if a child is stuck in a learning environment that is a mismatch for their intellectual abilities, then they may have, um, they may not get along with their peers. It's not that gifted children can't get along with peers. If they are competing at high levels, they may be more anxious and may need help managing that. It's not that gifted children are anxious. So we try to reframe these things and help parents understand um, ways of dealing with it that are non-pressured, but about, Devasin has been using this word, word not performance, but not performance-based, but rather mastery-based. 
that you're interested in a topic and therefore you want to know more about it and master it. Those are really important things for parents to sort of understand rather than just pushing the content. Yeah, Ruda, so that, that's very interesting. And in fact, uh, I'm glad you spoke about psychosocial skills. Uh, so I do want to open it up with the stage. Uh, Soumya, I need your help. Uh, are there people who have asked questions about these aspects like uh, Ruda spoke about uh, uh, difficulty in fitting with peers or motivation or fear of losing the label because I have a bunch of questions about that like children not getting motivated, not getting frustrated and angry if things don't go their way, hyper-processing brain and so on. So if there are some questions like that on chat, uh, maybe we can you know, ask these people to unmute themselves or you can pose the questions to the panel. And yeah. I'm sure Bhushan will have a lot to say apart from the others on the panel. Yeah, that particular kind, uh, that particular thread, I don't see any questions. Okay, then I'm going to then... Uh, yeah. Uh, I think you were talking about uh, how during the pandemic they wanted, uh, you know, to engage the child and what is, so yes. for, for me, the curiosity uh, basically to ask uh, Dr. Shukla is that uh, with the heavy usage of uh, digital media for the last uh, two and a half years, children, very young children having to sit constantly in a classroom facing um, a screen what kind of issues you know he gets in terms of children having problems or showcasing any kind of different behaviors which are not conducive do you find parents reaching out to you saying that the child is showing any kind of different kind of behavior so yeah, that's just that's a entirely different topic but that would take us away completely on a different yeah path. so 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 what and i suggest fitness. is yeah maybe we can come back to that in a while um because that, that's a topic, I think uh, it's, it's going to be a long topic. Uh, so, Soumya, is anybody putting up their hand to ask a question in this area? Otherwise, I can read out some questions. Uh, yeah, Bhushan. I haven't, haven't seen, can you hear me? I haven't seen any question in this domain. In this. Okay, okay, okay. So, you can just uh, send out a chat, uh, I mean, uh, or, or I can just ask people, does anybody want to ask a question related to this? I, I can... Uh, Bhushan, you were raising your hand. <laughs> well, we have lots of parents, probably mostly parents as our participants here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there, there are one or two things that I keep seeing in practice again and again. Okay, please. So I would like to point that out. Yeah. And this is specifically with Indian context. Yeah. So yeah. take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, see, any kind of interest, I'm not using the word talent or giftedness here any kind of interest or curiosity or self-learning that child is undertaking, it has two characteristics. One is that it's messy. Uh, it's not clean and tidy. And second is that it is absolutely never linear in terms of its output. So these are two things which parents want in their children all the time, particularly Indian parents. Uh, so if your insistence is on neatness and tidiness, and if you want children to produce measurable results at frequent intervals, uh, then you are in the wrong business. That is, that is really important. The second thing that one sees again and again is that children, they, you know, their curiosity drives them, literally leads them by the nose. And when child starts taking interest in something, and if that interest is sustained, then parents suspect that maybe this is the future vocation for my child. It does not matter if the child is just one and a half year old at that point of time. And that is again a particular Indian quality that unless a so-called talent is directly encashable, uh, it has really no value in life. Now somebody's interest in physics is unlikely to make them the next Bill Gates in this world, okay? And they may spend their entire life sitting in a room, uh, you know, solving equations which tell you how that whatever distant galaxy is moving, is it coming closer or it's going away? And that's perfectly fine. This is intolerable for a lot of parents. So this is something that they need to understand that everything is not encashable in life. In fact, most of the things are really not encashable at all. Another stuff that needs to go is that if you start reading about that subject 
after you have child has shown interest in that then you are really not an expert you are just somebody who is older than them has better resources and can read more rapidly than them it is better to take the children to other experts in that area most of the parents that we have on this group are from big urban clusters in india if your child is reading physics or getting interested it is better to let some other adult who has some knowledge in that area talk to your child because what is really important is that when the other adult talks to the child it may be a mechanical engineer it may be a physics teacher in local school or whatever they are likely to point the child to the right resources or understand their questions better or they can see actually two or three layers deeper where the child is coming from unless you are absolute world leading subject expert in that area please don't try to be your child's tutor because more likely than not you will actually harm the child i have i routinely come across children who give up a particular interest i know of a girl who was close to achieving her final grand master norm who gave up chess for good because her father was taking very keen interest in that you know see intelligent children absolutely love their freedom and parents and freedom particularly indian parents and freedom are not exactly sitting in the same box so this is something because parents are repeatedly asking how do i find the talent and how do i nurture the talent unfortunate simple and a very bitter answer is get the hell out of the way you know i think this is an extremely important point and um, uh i think bhushan ends up seeing this when things have actually reached a pretty advanced stage right whereas uh, much more can be done in the early stages um uh, we have only 15 minutes left so i don't want to keep uh, you know uh, talking so somya if uh, uh, yeah yeah uh, we can uh, i would prefer if uh, people unmute themselves or show themselves on video and speak and if you already put questions in the chat you can still just read it out and if you will give you like a few seconds if nobody is doing it then we will read out the questions but hopefully you know you will speak up and we see you and we get to know you to some of you so um, so you want me to do something uh, no i think I is somebody understand. raising a hand or okay or uh, uh, you might see someone unmuting or uh, okay let me get on to the let me see the participants yeah would somebody like to ask a question to the panel see we are going to respond to all the questions so yeah rishma you want to ask something uh, yeah i had put this to the chat box as well so i'm reading it out again yeah uh, yes. common threads that i see through all the things that my child who is who is now 7 years old is this whole idea of creating creativity so whether it is if she is learning yoga she would create a yoga posture and i don't want to talk too much about it but creativity is one thread which i have identified uh, as something that is runs through everything that she does now i just wanted to understand a little more about this what are the signs that you have seen amongst creative kids that you have worked with is this a very nebulous area or does it get more specific as the child grows older and manifests itself in one of the specific areas that's my question okay uh thanks for for that question maybe devisena you would like to go first and bhushan can add because i know that jana prabodhini has looked a lot at creativity and yeah uh yeah so actually uh when we look at creativity very young children and the age group that you are talking reshma are uh, they don't have these barriers as they get older the structures that we are talking about so they are constantly flipping everything and trying to see it very differently now the question is that again how are they able to like i've seen a boy who's uh, tearing everything apart and making something completely new if he has a battery uh, or operated uh, let's say a car or something he removes everything and then he wants to fix it with something else which may not be a part of the car itself so 
they have a purpose that's what we would want they they have something in their mind that they want to see and they want to see how it works and it is nice to encourage them and to talk about it basically to find out what are they seeing and to continue to encourage them that is what will be uh, useful in uh, that particular age group because if we go into specifics then again we break the process of giving them the freedom to look at how they want to see it so if they are creative encourage them don't put a kind of a barometer by saying that this is not going to bring anything in terms of performance in school or this is not something which is useful later these sensitive comments really takes away from their learning process basically so parents can encourage find different i mean there are a lot of uh, people today who do storytelling who do art and craft uh, not just as a product and saying i have done origami but who will talk about how the child can see the paper in different ways how they cut it and then if they like yesterday i had a child who was four and a half and she was teaching samina uh, samina was saying you use the pencil to fold the paper she said no i want you to use your finger because her finger was very small she's four and a half and she said no you use it like this and i will flip it over so they have something in their mind and we need to go along with them and not be obstruction that's what i would really say thank you uh, bushan would you like to add something so the, these are some of the substrates of talent and giftedness i think uh, we need to separate uh, the ability and the substrates that are required for it for example curiosity would be a very common substrate from a physicist to probably a cricket batsman you know people who are willing to look at the same data in a different way same experience in a different way try out different things there this is how people find out more things right so curiosity uh, creativeness a lot of energy being more focused on the process than a specific answer or a specific outcome uh even memory is quite important because you see lot of the children particularly for area of their interest they have enormous memory devoted to that and they can connect things there and learn further more so these are all substrates of uh, talent that we are looking at there and they would be common across the board so a child who is coming up with very creative solutions for their day to day problem uh, is is likely to have that ability that will take them further we don't know which area they will choose as the focused area to apply their creativity but this is a general quality which is absolutely essential without that they can't move on uh thanks bushan uh, bushan i want to ask you a couple of questions because there are some parents uh, who talked about um, uh, children having attention problems writing disability there is a parent of an autistic child who says that my 5 year old son can uh, uh, write over 300 words he's autistic and minimally verbal so i am looking for ways to use his love love for letters and words to read more express himself not rely just on speech so i want us to spend a few minutes just on uh is there some uh are these kind of traits more common in gifted students or sometimes do these things come together do these need special intervention so perhaps you can start the ball rolling and devsen and roda can add to this yeah so uh, as far as i know uh, there is no one to one correlation of these things mm. okay because uh, having a learning difficulty is something that you see at, even at a diagnosable level you see that in 3 to 5% children and near diagnostic level in almost 10% children so there would be a huge overlap of this anyway unfortunately the way our media works and the way our attention works einstein having dyslexia though it's completely false is a sentence that is used by every parent of child with dyslexia that i meet and that unfortunately takes us in the wrong direction my my take as a as a child psychiatrist is that if there is a identified uh, disability or a difficulty with a child uh, then 
it actually requires a specific help from professionals who understand that disability better. Because again, another thing that people say is that if you are disability in one area, you are guaranteed to be gifted in some other area, uh, which is again, you know, uh, it's, it's a complete whitewash. It doesn't work that way. What it means is that if one door is closed, you need to find another door that can be opened. It may or may not do the entire job of that, but we need to find other ways. And typically with an identified disability, professionals are probably best place to help that child because from a single question or from a single data point, I think it is unfair to understand the whole child and give an answer about that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bhushan. Ruda, I want, you want to, yeah. I want you to really support what um, Bhushan is saying because it goes back to the definition of gifted and that we started with. If you believe that gifted is a stable trait like curly hair and blue eyes, then you just sort of say, then when your child has other issues, you just say, oh, it's because they're gifted, right? If you believe that giftedness is malleable and can change over time and has levers of opportunities, so for example, it will develop if um, you're doing deliberate practice, you're open to feedback and critique, um, and you develop so psychosocial skills, then you believe that you can make a difference in the trajectory of talent development. For those parents who believe when their children um, display other sorts of um, issues in the classroom, right? They're sometimes, um, because there's a mismatch between their setting and what they really can do, they're not challenged in the classroom, they may start acting um, with behaviors that the teacher doesn't particularly appreciate. Um, parents will say it's because they're gifted and not take care of the issue. That's okay when it's just a behavior, well, it's not okay. We always want to address it so that we can get the child into the challenging and, and appropriate educational context for them. What I worry about with that is that if a parent says it's because they're gifted, then what can happen is they can be masking when it is a psychological problem that needs addressing or a learning disability that needs addressing. So if you think of it not as a stable trait, giftedness, but something that can develop, then when you see these other behaviors, you can say, wait, my child is just an advanced learner, right? Learning um, at a different rate to their peers. There shouldn't be issues like extreme um, anxiety. There shouldn't be issues like a learning disability there shouldn't be those issues. I need to pay attention to those and find the right professionals for that issue. It's not because they're gifted that, that that's the way they are. And I think that's important to get your child to the right professional. So first we try the interventions. Is this a mismatch of what my child can do and where they're sitting in a classroom? Because that can lead to anxiety, it can lead to uh, all sorts of psychological issues that aren't because of the giftedness, but because of the mismatch. And then after that, do I need a professional help for this? And I think that's really important because people often don't seek that help because they're attributing it to the giftedness. Thanks, Rora. Okay, I'm compelled to do some time management now. We're already at the one and a half hour mark. Uh, so what, uh, and I'm realizing that we simply did not have enough time. We could not address the school and teachers. Sorry for that. We will have a, another session dedicated only to uh, many of the teachers and the school's uh, questions. And there are, we can do a whole thing on psychosocial skills and technology with device addiction. So what I would like to do now is uh, Meghna has raised her hand. So we will take Meghna's question. After responding to Meghna's question, I would like Rhoda to very quickly talk about uh, online programs for young children. Do they work? How do they work? And after that, we'll formally close the session. If some of our panelists are available for five to 10 minutes, we'll take one or two burning questions. But uh, after these two points, we'll pretty much formally close the session. So Meghna, please go ahead and uh, ask your question. 
Uh, first of all, thank you uh, all the panelists for a very nice discussion. I wanted to ask uh, on the what Devsena ma'am was saying about the curiosity and they tend to go, the questioning tends to go deeper and deeper. And uh, it, uh, like my kid has persistent interest in dinosaurs, but the that is the thing we provide him with a lot of books and all and we should find an expert who can guide him. But the general day-to-day -day curiosity also goes uh, like beyond many subject and whatever he sees that why it, why is this thing this way it can go from physics science geography or uh, how is the ac working how is it cooling and also many times uh, sometimes it gets frustrating or sometimes i'm not the expert and i'm not able to uh, guide him properly so and this uh, He's five, so the area is not yet like the uh, curiosity sparks across subjects. So uh, uh, sometimes I feel that how can I guide him? Like sometimes I feel inadequate to answer his questions. Can I go ahead? Yeah, please, please, please. Thank you, Meghna, for asking. Uh, this is a question I think most parents uh, would face. Uh, I'm going to talk about from the parenting point of view. Um, when we look at the talent and as parents, it's very exciting and a very proud moment to see that the child enjoys things uh, which you don't find other children doing it. At the same time, it becomes challenging to constantly give the child the kind of resources that is required. We have to realize as parents that we have to balance by giving as much as we can at the same time focus on other areas as well. And as a parent, uh, if we stress too much, that becomes a little difficult even for the child because the child can feel the stress that you're experiencing and wanting to ensure he gets, uh, I mean, when parents feel that I'm not able to answer because of my incapability of understanding the topic that he or she is going through. Uh, I think we shouldn't feel like that. Having a very positive, encouraging environment is very important towards learning. I've had where parents have said that if the child is interested, like you said, dinosaurs, uh, this parent, I think she was in Bangalore and she said for about six months, constantly, every Sunday, they were there at the museum. And the child would go on observing and finding deeper meanings and ask questions to her if she's not able to un uh, understand or the question or not able to answer, it is okay. She would just see if she can supply it with extra books. Some, and once she even took the child with an appointment to the directors who can talk, find resource people who can kind of give that added information, that's perfectly fine. Uh, stressing in terms of seeing that we need to give till he or she finds a final answer may not always happen. Sometimes the resources are available, sometimes it's not. And it's just frustrating, but you can be encouraging of seeing how he can use that information, talking to other people and seeing how he can keep himself engaged. I think that's very important. Uh, and another thing is we really don't know how long he or she is going to be interested in that as well. So a couple of years later, you'll find it will be something else. And it will be the same journey, an in-depth study on that particular topic. So keeping an encouraging and a positive environment is very important. And being very calm and peaceful yourself as a parent, I think that is what I would like to emphasize basically in the learning process. I'm sure Rhoda would have something more. Thanks. Well, it's a good segue to the computer, to the online issue, um, because I would say I agree with everything uh, you've said in terms of find the people who can help and find the context in your city where you can take your child to discover those interests. And if there are supplemental um, programs, please put your child into those because that are you know enrichment based and 
and so on, because one of the things those programs do is they put your child in contact with other children who are like them. And, and that's important because children need peers who are as interested as them uh, and have their sort of focus on a particular topic. So what we do really early on is we have, and the other thing is what you were pointing to, Meghna, is this issue of how do I ask those higher order questions? How, I don't, I'm not the expert. I'm not an educator and I'm not the expert in the content. How do I do that? And so we have a program for very young children called online family program, which you do with your child. So it's online, it's asynchronous, so you can do it whenever you want. Um, and basically there, there are gu there's guidance for parents on asking questions and what activities to do with children and what materials to use. So you're not sort of making, you know, if you're doing an engineering problem, you're you're doing it, you're ha having your child do it with plastic bottles, you know, not, not some fine materials. Um, but, but so that is a great program because learning is relational and it can be a very deep and meaningful experience if you let your child guide it. And if you learn just to post the, the, the materials online, not do the materials, for your, not do the activities for your child. And so we have a lot of we're trying to train the parents, really. It's a, ch a program for children, but we're trying to train parents in these, in how to sort of be calm, how to ask the higher order questions and how to learn in a playful way with their children. Um, and so that's an online family program that we have very early on. As the children grow, get to about third grade, we have live online classes. Those are not click through. And I think that this we've noticed culturally is a very different way to um, teaching online programs than one finds typically in India. And so what we do is the child is in the setting. We do them on Saturday mornings and in summer. And so it's late your time, but um, they're 10 to one on a Saturday morning. I'm going there right now actually, but to our Saturday morning programs, but the weekend live online programs, children come in from around the world and, um, the teacher will sort of frame activities. We use the breakout groups so children are still having their small group discussions together. Um, teachers use in how to engage children online, strategies for engaging students online. So for example, they'll use the whiteboard um, so that the, the children can put forward their ideas uh, and help uh, make the class. They'll share resources, but have the children go offline into their living rooms and create the object and bring it back for, um, for feedback and peer review and so on. So the child is still doing the actual hands-on building and bringing that um, opportunity back. It's not just clicking through a program and, and getting to the end point. So I'm gonna put in the chat all of these um, sorts of programs that you can check out. You can always email me. And um, you know there are a lot of students, international students in those programs, uh, of course, as well. And um, particularly in, in summer, if the Saturday night class is too late for you. And the important thing is that we're not just doing algebra. Right? We're not doing the things you're going to get in school. We're doing the things that translate that core curriculum into something that is uh, they won't find in school, like pre-med. We have a pre-med class where you try out on a little bit on oncology or pharmacology or brain science, etc. cetera. Um, these are the sorts of topics that we work Forensic science, you'll have students in a classroom online working on how to determine how the cucumber pickle um, was murdered. <laughs> Teachers will stuff these pickles with various things that lead students to determine what the murder weapon could have been and how that happened. These are sorts of the fun ways in which we'll address these topics. So I'm going to put an email in the but the main thing about online, I just want to say, is also it has to be constructed. The students have to be constructing their education. And so if they're just clicking through, that is not incorporating the creativity or the engagement for students that they need. Thank you so much, Rhoda. So Rhoda has shared some links. She will uh, share her email ID. Uh, 
Um, so we uh, obviously have a lot more questions which you have not addressed, but uh, uh, if you have sent your question on chat, on public chat addressed to everyone, it will be saved. So we will get back to you. Uh, please also join us next Friday on the 18th of February. Some of your questions can perhaps be picked up there. We won't have this panel here, but we'll try our uh, best uh, to address some of those questions. We will also have uh, in the next two, three months, we will have some further uh, uh, sessions. Thank you.